Okay, I know this went a bit fast, so I've been asked to make sure um, I have a, a clear and reviewable version of our example of an energy balance on eating food. So let's look at this here. We have this general equation, which is you have some food and oxygen, and it turns into CO2 and water, and it liberates uh, some energy as it does that. And in fact, it's a good assumption, it's a reasonable assumption, not a perfect assumption, that if you have, for example, X carbons in your food, you should add X oxygens in order to metabolize it, and you will get out X CO2s and X waters. So it's not a perfect assumption, but it's reasonable. And, uh, and you'll see that in action in a second. So if you want to know how much energy comes out uh, when you do this metabolism, or in fact, same difference, set it on fire, kind of indistinguishable except for how fast it goes, that equation will be the heat liberated or used uh, is equal to the sum of the heats of formation or the enthalpy of formation for each of the products minus the sum of the enthalpy of formation for the reactants. And you say, okay, that's lovely. Where does that come from? Well, delta H of formation is something that you look up. It's a, uh, at standard state, it's a constant that can be found in the literature. And you say, what literature? Well, in this case, you can find it in Google. You can find it in the National Institute of Standards and Technology web book. So just Google that, and you'll find it there. And they'll have all of these values uh, tabulated where you can find them. And then to figure out what happens in an actual reaction, you put them together where you have the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants. And just as a reminder, the products are the things that are on this side, so in this case CO2 and water, and the reactants are the things on this side, in this case the food and the oxygen. Okay, let's do a specific example on the next page. Okay, so here's our specific example from class, which has sucrose combining with oxygen to give us carbon dioxide and water. And you'll see it kind of adheres to that uh, assumption, I said, we have 12 carbons coming in, so we're using 12 oxygens and we're getting 12 CO2s out, and in this case, 11 waters, but it's pretty close, so we will use this exact reaction this time. So in order to find the energy liberated, I'm going to write our energy balance. Q equals the sum of the heats of enthalpies of formation for the products. So the products, let's see, I've got 12 CO2, so I'm going to write delta HF of CO2, and then that's plus 11 times the delta HF of water. Okay, so notice I just got these values from here, stoichiometric coefficients, and I've got to multiply them by my delta HF, uh, which is something that I'm going to look up. And then I'm going to subtract 1 times the enthalpy of formation for sugar. Remember this sugar is sucrose, it's shown up there. And then remember I'm subtracting everything in this summation, so this one gets a negative sign too. 12 times the delta HF of oxygen. Okay, so there's my overall equation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up, and as I said I can refer to the NIST web book, I can Google it, it's something Wolfram Alpha may be able to give you, um, it's something that you could probably find in the back of most chemistry textbooks, or you can use the handout I provided in class to turn these values, these delta H of formation values, into actual numbers that we can do math on. Uh, so I'm going to use my handout from class and meet you back here in just a moment with those numbers. Okay, so now I'm looking at that table that we had in class, and I see the delta H of formation for CO2 is negative 394, and units are always important, kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that's the value we're going to use times 12 there, 
and the delta H of formation for water is... Where did water go? Oh, I'm going to have to look it up. It's not on here, so we'll have to Google that one. So let's go do that right now. So I've decided um, that there's a really nice table of these values in Wikipedia, and uh, those are referenced, in fact, in NIST, so I'm going to go ahead and use that. Now, you might be wondering, should I be talking about liquid water here or water vapor here? And uh, we're going to use water vapor because uh, when you're exhaling, the water tends to be in the vapor state, um, not actually as liquid droplets coming out. So the value we are going to want to use here is negative 241 point, let's see, point 0.82. And that's again kilojoules per mole. Okay, referring to our sheet, we see that the value for uh, sucrose is negative, negative 2,221 kilojoules per mole, and oxygen. Well, oxygen actually is in its standard state, so there's nothing to react it from, so the, the value for oxygen is, in fact, zero. So that makes this kind of easy. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go grab my calculator, and I'm going to multiply 12 by negative 394, and then I'm going to add that to 11 times negative 241, and then I am going to subtract negative 222.1. Okay, so that's going to be pretty straightforward, I think. Just an algebraic operation. Okay, so I put all that together, and I get negative 5,167... Uh, kilojoules per mole. Now that's lovely and all, uh, but uh, that isn't the answer that was requested because I asked for it in grams. So now we have to do some unit conversions. We're going to have to do two unit conversions actually. So the first one, here's the easy one, is uh, how many kilojoules in a kilocalorie. Okay, and it turns out that we have about 4.2 kilojoules in one kilocalorie. And when you look at a food label, kilocalories is what it's actually in, even though it says the word calorie. I don't know why they do it that way, but they do. Welcome to the United States. Every place else in the world actually uses the K to indicate you're talking about a thousand. But whatever. Okay, so there we go. So uh, we've got that conversion factor that we're going to use. Uh, but how do I turn moles into grams? Um, how do I do that? Well, gee, let's see. Well, moles... To turn moles into grams, you need to know the molecular mass, the molecular weight. So this is a thing that's on our handout, um, and also is completely Googleable. But you need to know the molecular weight of what? Well, we said calories per gram of sugar, so it's the molecular weight of sugar we're asking about. So now we need to know, pardon me, what that mass is. So that's one mole, and you don't have to calculate this, you can just look it up, and it's in the handout, is uh, 342 grams. Okay, so now we look at this, we see our units are all going to work because kilojoules cancels with kilojoules, moles cancels with moles, and we're going to be left with an answer in kilocals per gram. And what I get doing that and rounding off is about 3.6 kcal per gram. Now, some of the people in class uh, had a slightly higher number than that, and I think that's because they used a different value for water. Remember, I said this value here, the negative 241, is the value for making water vapor. It's actually uh, a little bit higher, or larger negative number, uh, for making liquid water. So um, you'll get a slightly different answer there. And also, we may have different answers because uh, we were carrying different numbers of significant figures uh, based on which value we were calculating. So, uh, nevertheless, my conclusion is I think we have negative 3.6 cal uh, kilocalories per gram. And all this negative means doesn't mean the energy is negative. It means the energy is leaving the system, uh, which makes sense. We know that you can take sugar and you can actually set it on fire, uh, and we know that when we eat sugar, we have energy available metabolically to do work, so uh, it must be that energy is liberated from the system. So good, we expected that negative. And the thing that I had us do at the very end of class was look at a package of sugar and actually uh, 
figure out how many calories were in a gram according to the sugar package. And that came out to be um, right around 3.45, negative 3.45. So we're really close. So there you go. So that is an example. So if you want to do this again uh, for a problem such as you will see uh, in the homework, uh, all you have to do is sum up your delta H of formation for all of the products, making sure you multiply them by their stoichiometric number, and then subtract off the delta H of formation for all of the reactants. Again, multiplying through uh, if you need to. Um, but uh, we save a lot of work because this number for oxygen is always going to be zero, so whether it's 12 times zero or 40 times zero, it's still zero, so you can save yourself the effort. Uh, and then that will come out as your answer. And the last step is always going to be a unit conversion because we don't eat food in terms of moles. Usually you don't say, oh, I'm going to go have a mole of cheeseburger, right? You have no idea what that is. We eat food in terms of mass. You say, ah, I'm going to have a quarter pounder with cheese. So uh, you'll have to do that conversion where you turn the moles back into grams and uh, the kilocalories or kilojoules back into kilocalories to be able to have numbers that make sense to most people. And so that's what we're going to do. Thanks a lot. Um, see you later.